have uh, a series of speaker presentation uh, to connect our student community with uh, our business or government as well. And we have that tradition every year to work with our um, MLA. Um, if you don't know what that means, then I'll let you I suppose that was a quiz question. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this. Yes. Uh, to this to the first um, business, uh, business uh, speaker series presentation of the season 2023 24. And um, I want to first. Welcome our speaker tonight. Uh, he is our new MLA, and it is an uh, opportunity to congratulate her. She was elected back in May. We didn't have a chance for that. Congratulations. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Our president, uh, Dr. Bree, will tell you more about her. He is going to introduce her to Paul. So, welcome and sit, listen, enjoy the video. And the report to your office. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Appreciate it. It's a uh, real privilege to have her. There, I gave you the quiz. Yes. <laughs> so, we didn't know you taught both economics and political science. Uh, Jennifer Johnson serves as our local writer from Pinoca in LA here. As Dr. said, in May of this year, uh, we are so pleased to have you uh, join us for our inaugural 2023-2024 Business Speaker Series presentation. It's great to have you. Your presentation, Communication, Leadership, and Conflict is uh, so relevant to, for, for us today. Just to let uh, you know a little bit about uh, Mrs. Johnson and her background, she lives fairly close to us uh, out by Denver. She is a farmer, uh, operates a very successful prairie fruit orchard. I have not heard that term before. I know that uh, we can grow a few fruits here. I grew up in Okanagan Valley, and that's where I think of uh, when I hear orchards and so forth. But it uh, operates a prairie fruit orchard that has been in the business for almost 15 years since 2009. So that's got to say something to business students to uh, know that uh, our business has been successful for that long and that things are going well. In her previous life, was a registered nurse uh, at the University of Alberta, the National Science of Nursing. But uh, significantly important is that Mrs. Johnson is very active in her community, uh, which comes right up uh, to the current time being elected as MLA. But she has served in a variety of roles locally within the Agricultural Society. I served as director and president of the Canadian Cherry Producers. It's a, a club that I have not heard about before, but I'm sure it has some interesting stories to it. Also, in Bentley and area, uh, worked in the multi use facility building at society as the chair and the Bentley 4 H club as a leader. Recently, received two awards. Center of Learning at Home, Family of the Year 2022, and Parent of Distinction in 2023. That's this year. Uh, in her spare time, if that isn't enough to keep one's busy, in her spare time, she writes children's books. Uh, she has published a book, Cherries Just Right. Married and with four children. <coughs> we are walking down the sidewalk past the library and her daughter came out of the library and said hey come on i'm here <laughs> and that's uh, uh, great to see her uh, you have to know that her daughter was elected yesterday as the captain of the akron airs team here on campus oh, wow. so, uh, in a very diminishing amount of spare time that uh, she has to spend. She enjoys time in her orchard, she enjoys time listening to music, participating in agricultural advocacy, 
And uh, one very important thing you need to know about Mrs. Johnson, too, is she loves Jesus. And that's very important for our school. So uh, we welcome you. Uh, you were welcomed as 972nd member of the Legislative Assembly earlier, but we welcome you to Vermont University. <laughs> Because of that, we're going to say a word of prayer and enter a good way for us. Sure. Let's, let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can meet together this evening and to uh, hear and be present. And uh, we want to ask that you bless uh, Jennifer with her presentation. And uh, we are glad that you place uh, within the heart of uh, your people a desire to be of service and to uh, serve the constituency of this area. Bless her in that endeavor. Bless us as we are here and as we listen, as, as we uh, learn and have this opportunity for fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. I did raise four kids, and uh, I know a couple of you here know at least one of them, right? And I'm supposed to tease one of them tonight for saying, I may be late for acronyms because I have to go listen to your mom tomorrow night. <laughs> so I'm going to try to have this wrapped up by 8 o'clock and uh, it is a delight to be here. Thank you for the invitation to come. It really is an honor and privilege to be here today. So I had I a whole list of, uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about myself if you did way beyond uh, the introduction. Um, David's been at our house, he knows I'm just a mom and just a servant in the community, like probably would soon be here. So I think I'm just actually going to skip that. We're going to go straight into our into communication. And I would say communication for decades has been the top or at least second to the top main reasons for divorce in North America and probably around the world. It's still is today. And it doesn't stop there. It's also one of the top reasons employees leave their jobs. So if communication can be firmly and positively established, it creates a constructive, healthy, happy and productive workplace and business. So this evening, I want to highlight three pillars that will ultimately lead to deeper maturity and the skills necessary to be a better communicator and a leader. And those three pillars are to you know yourself, to know yourself, to know others, and then to lead and serve from your strengths. We keep coming back to this a little bit evening. But before I do, I want to ask you again, what is an MLA? Anybody know? It's going to be on the test. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's go through just a, a member just means there are 87 members in the province. Member means you're an MLA. The legislative assembly is the legislature in where? Edmonton. Edmonton. I heard somebody say it. It's in Edmonton. We assemble. So it is the assembly member of the legislative assembly. It's going to be under test. So I'll ask you again at the end. And you guys will all get one point for that. So knowing yourself is important and should be treated with very careful consideration. A healthy awareness of your strengths, weaknesses, personality, motivations, your values, and worldview will enable you to work from your strengths and ultimately equip you to bring up the best in others and maximize your potential. However, an unhealthy amount and reflection and focus on yourself can lead to self-centeredness and even narcissism. This will rob from the ability to build up others and ultimately erode good leadership. So I'm going to grab another okay, Rick Warren and his bestseller. Who's read this book? This is, you in the room. This is a purpose driven light. Who can tell me the first line in the book? It's four words. What? Did you say it? Did you all hear that? Can you say it again? It's not about you. It's not about you. So if we're wanting to learn more about ourselves, that almost seems like a self-defeating statement. Like, uh, my parents didn't have any children, and I can't speak a word of English. <laughs> Those statements are self-defeating, sort of like this. It's not about you, but I want to know more about me. But it really isn't. Because a healthy <clears throat> examination allows us to know about ourselves and invest into others. I would recommend this book if you haven't read it. 
um, look into, especially if all you get past is that first chapter, it's not about you, it's worth it. It's a few pages long, it's a 40 day devotional, and I would I'd highly recommend it. It's easily incorporated into your life. And I am going to highlight a few. I'm a reader, I love books, and so I'm going to highlight some of my favorites here tonight. If you want to write them down, I've got them up on the overhead here, and you can make note of that. So taking a manageable and reasonable amount of time to know and understand who you are and your purpose leads to knowing the purpose, and it is a gift we can pass on to others. There's perhaps a hundred, hundreds of methods that you can use to know yourself better for the sake of time tonight. I'm just going to highlight a couple, and the first is personality. There are lots of different ways you can examine personality. There's the Enneagram, some of you have done that. Anybody done the yeah, Enneagram or Myers Briggs? That's an old one, maybe 50s, 60s, 70s, and they're maybe a little bit past. Um, there's the colors. If somebody have some of you have done that, did any of you go to the Ceric Center on um, this past? <coughs> you did a little bit about the personalities there, I understand, and with the colors. Um, we won't go into them that much, but I will just talk about it briefly. Um, my favorite is the four P's, and each of them is associated with an animal. We'll talk just slightly, just refer to those animals briefly. So the first one is the powerful choleric, represented by the lion. The popular sanguine, represented by the playful otter. The perfect melancholy, represented by the beaver. And the peaceful phlegmatic, isn't he cute? The Labrador Retriever. So the first one, I'm gonna go back to the powerful personality. And I'm gonna start with this because it's probably the easiest one to recognize and represented by the lion because he is the king of the jungle. He is powerful. He's the born leader, the class president, the CEO, the president, uh, the professional athletes, some typical words that might describe this personality are control, commander, self-assurance, iron will, dominate, take charge, determination, decision-making, power, faster, stronger, complete. Now these words might evoke positive or negative emotions in you. They tend to evoke negative ones for most people because it's such a powerful personality. <clears throat> The choleric will take control, right wrongs, make instant decisions, and come across, can come across as bossy. They often don't have a lot of friends and they don't feel the need for a lot of friends. This can come across as aggressive or offensive, but remember the choleric can almost run anything. They are goal oriented, they're well organized, great delegators, they excel in emergencies. And they can rise to unexpected situations and lead off in new directions. Our sanguine, as we're going through this, think about yourself, where you might fit in, and even others around you say, a uh, few of the words I might say, you might think, hey, I know who's exactly like that. So keep that in mind as we're going through. The sanguine personality, or the popular personality, is represented by the playful otter. They don't, they do have a lot of friends even if they're very superficial. They can walk in a room and it's the second you have spoken to someone, your friends. They turn work into fun, drawing people to themselves if they're outgoing, positive demeanor. They tend to be cheerleaders, comedians, hosts, greeters, masters of ceremonies, club presidents. They can appear to be superficial, considering every new acquaintance a friend. Their natural curiosity and wide-eyed innocence can make them appear simple or unintelligent. In an attempt to be helpful and popular, they will volunteer for anything and everything without any thought to the consequences. But they are full of exciting new ideas and they're highly likable drawing people to themselves. The melancholy the perfect personality, and it is perfect not because they are perfect, but because they aspire to it. They are devoted to perfectionism. They're thoughtful, deep, and analytical, usually introverted. They tend to be pessimistic or seeing problems before they happen and counting the cost. 
they are willing to stick to a dull routine if they see the results at the end. They tend to be talented and creative, enjoying lists and charts and graphs and figures and conscious of every detail. So what kind of uh, occupation would, would fit into that? Counting. 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 It's the first one everyone says. <laughs> Career paths are accounting, architecture. Better be. When I drive across a bridge, I hope a melancholy designed that bridge. Art, philosophy, literature, engineers, accountants, inventors, and scientists. And some people are surprised when they hear art or philosophy. But think of Michelangelo. Only melancholy could have come up with what he did, or be a Mozart, a Beethoven. They are neat and tidy generally economical with deep concern and compassion. Now, finally is the phlegmatic, and I've left this one to the end for two reasons. First, the phlegmatic is the ultimate procrastinator. <laughs> and so, <laughs> second, they are the hardest ones to spot because they are so stable and reliable. They're the ultimate balancer in any situation. And they are the most difficult to identify. They're the easiest ones to get along with. They are a delight to have around. They're happy wherever they're placed. They tolerate a flexible schedule. They like friends, but they're happy to be alone too. Nothing seems to bother them. They're generally good with administrative abilities. They're great mediators, easy to get along with, and they generally have a lot of friends. So I want you to go back to the first pillar, getting to know yourself. Do any of these resonate with you? And maybe a little bit of every one of them resonates with you. <coughs> Keep in mind, we all have certain qualities in all of the personality profiles. Do you think you might have equal characteristics of one of them, though? Or of, of all of them? And think, too, that whatever you have the most of is what is probably your personality profile. <laughs> so do you have equal characteristics? If that's the case, you actually might be a phlegmatic, balanced, and stable. For the rest of us, we tend to identify with one of the other three as our dominant profile. These characteristics can ebb and flow, changing as we age or mature, mature, gain experience. But for the most part, you are born with your personality and you will have it for life. Knowing this enables you to know your strengths and to work out of them to serve others. Recognize your weaknesses and work on overcoming them. Remember this, your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. It is true in your personality as well. So operating out of your weakness, consider this, the cleric is a natural leader, but they can become a tyrant as a boss. The sanguine, who is the one energetically inspiring others, can overcommit and underdeliver. The melancholy, devoted to the high standard of detail, can be hard to please and often sets the bar too high. And the phlegmatic can be indecisive, hard to get moving, and they can struggle with making decisions in their effort to please others. The second pillar comes in knowing others and their personalities. Other people in your life are not necessarily wrong, and they are not put there to annoy you. Their different personality means they see life differently, and they will respond to it differently. Different is not wrong, remember that. <laughs> Likewise, our personalities that are similar to us are not a threat or an inconvenience. Two sanguines might be competing for the spotlight, but they can be gracious in sharing it. Two cholerics may be competing for the leadership role, but they can collaborate with each other's strengths. As a boss, understanding the personalities of your employees or volunteers is crucial in utilizing their strengths to everyone's benefit. And as an employee, recognizing your boss's personality can help you understand their expectations and work reasonably within them to the benefit of everyone. Ultimately, this fulfills the third pillar, growing in knowledge of yourself and others, and then responding in a way that leads and serves others. If you want to go do a deeper dive into this, like we could literally spend a semester alone on just studying personalities. Um, this is my favorite book on it. It's written by Florence Mitchell. It's very old. And I let's move it back here. That's the new version of it because they just keep uh, putting out new printings of it. So there's the new one. It's Personality Plus by Florence Mitchell. 
And her daughter is Marita Litauer. She goes more, she, she does the same thing as her mom, but she has modernized and is using the colors that some of you learned about this past weekend. And this is her book, Wired That Way. Meaning your personalities, you were born with it and you've got to play and work within it. So these are two really good books that I love. And uh, if you want to, to find out a little bit more, it takes about 10 minutes to do the test. And you can just go online and do it with through either of these books. They have a very similar test, it's really quick. And you can learn a little bit more about yourself, a little bit more about the people around you, if that's something that interests you. So a second way of getting to know yourself is through the love languages. Can you be familiar with this? Who's, who's read or knows of the love languages? This is Dr. Gary Chapman. How many copies has he sold worldwide now? Any guesses? One million. How many? One million. One times 20. <laughs> Over 20 million copies now worldwide and growing all the time. It just hasn't gone away because it resonates so deeply within all of us. So those five love languages are acts of service, <coughs> receiving gifts, quality time, words of affirmation, and physical touch. Like the personality traits, we have characteristics of all of these, but one of them will be dominant in each of us. And at different seasons and at different times, we are going to draw on specific um, love part languages. And, and you will think, well, this is, uh, gift is my primary one, but then a year later, you find out, well, wait a minute, the, it seems like words is kind of taken over, it must have changed. You were born with your primary love language as well, but they do ebb and flow with different seasons, and it's for life. So the first one we're going to look at is acts of service. And some examples of this would be like washing someone's car, taking out the garbage, making someone's bed or their lunch, driving somebody somewhere if they don't have a car, or like this grandma just cooking with her granddaughter. Looks like beautiful. The second one is receiving gifts. And this can sound a little bit intimidating, but it really isn't. It can literally be something as small as a slushy or a chocolate bar or a special pen. The point is you were thinking of someone when you made the effort to do this purchase. Small or big usually doesn't matter. But to people who tend to have gifts as their love language, special days are very important to them. Remember this. And a thoughtful gift goes a long way. Quality time is about full, intentional, undivided attention. And I think more than ever, this is really relevant today in a day of earphones and music and these things here. Put them away. Take your headphones off. Don't just put your phone in your pocket, put it away and be present with someone who's that sort of language. Don't be going like this because the text just came in. Be really aware. That's a great way to love. Words of affirmation or encouragement are used to build someone up verbally. Words of character or to someone's nature or accomplishments are the most valuable. Like, you worked really hard on that, or you played that song beautifully, or I'm proud of you, or the most meaningful of all, I love you. Superficial comments can be acceptable if they're sincere and not the main focus or too often, like that color looks really good on you, but we have nothing to do with that color, right? So be careful with those comments, or that's a great car, or good game. These are comments that are really beyond the control of the individual being addressed, but it's still a positive comment that has association with that person. Appropriate physical touch is the last one. And I use the word appropriate in this because this one I think needs more attention in its delivery. And um, it has potential to carry very great negative consequences. I was actually at a conference in Regina this past summer for parliamentarians across Canada, and this was brought up again because it's just such an important issue. And I'm going to refer back to the comments that were brought up at this conference as well. Some of the, the suggestions that were passed on to us are for acquaintances or casual friends, a slight, and this is especially true in the business world, a slight touch. And this, we're going to get really specific between your elbow and your shoulder. 
is appropriate. A slight touch, that's it. And if you cover, if you're wearing a t shirt, don't touch the skin. Uh, for good friends, a side hug or a shoulder hug is appropriate. And this is especially true in the business world. For close friends, perhaps a front hug and arm touches. Be very aware of cultural and generational differences. Some cultures, like the Latino culture, do air kisses. In another culture, only touch rooms within a family is appropriate. And be very cautious and slow to engage when you are using touch. Does that person visibly, if I come and touch an arm with a man at a business meeting, just go like this, and then watch, watch the visible cues and the, the non-visible cues. Do they pull away? Don't do it again. Pull back, in fact, take a step backwards. Um, do they instantly engage in their eyes side up a little bit? Maybe that was okay. Maybe it was um, an acceptable form in that, in that time. So be very slow to engage and be aware of the response you get. Love languages can be expressed in deposits or withdrawals. As expressed above, it can fill your love tank until it overflows into others. It can also empty your love tank by withholding or abusing a love language. Think about what your love language is, if any of these resonate with you, and how you felt when it was withheld from you. And I'm going to give you a few situations. We're each going to go with one of these. And here's the first one. You share a room with a roommate or a sibling, and you're constantly doing acts of service because that's meaningful to you. For that person, you take out the garbage regularly. Sometimes you make the bed, tidy their room. You might even wash the window if it gets dirty. Your roommate never notices, never does anything in return. You might be at work helping your coworkers in lots of small ways, and you keep the workplace very tidy. Even in your co-workers areas where you make sure that some of your administrative duties are completed without ask, you being asked in a timely manner because they forgot. When your boss notices, your co-worker takes all the credit. Number two, it's your birthday. Your family is busy and they didn't get you anything. They acknowledge your birthday. They mention it's a good thing you have everything anyway and you don't need it yet. Additionally, all your friends and co-workers forgot and they didn't get you anything either. Three weeks of, this is the third one, three weeks have gone by and you, I hope you, you guys should relate to this, you're three weeks into school. They've gone by, you are so busy with school assignments or work that you, and learning what an MLA is, that you haven't spent any time with your family or friends. You are feeling rather empty. So you go over to your friend's place and he is happy to see you, he or she. You and, uh, your friend though is very preoccupied with the newest video game or mm -hmm. the texts coming in. You eventually make an excuse and go home. Next one, number four, you've studied hard for a test and worked hard on a project and the problem you hear from your significant other is you couldn't do any better than that? Yes. Or you worked really hard in a game of basketball or soccer Another sport, and you hear someone comment on your missed shot. Some of the worst and most abusive comments that can be said would be, I hate you, or you're worthless. Or in the last one, you come home after being away for an extended period of time, there's no hug. Touch can be withheld and cause withdrawal, but even worse, it can be used in violence, a slap across the face or a punch from a clenched fist or physical and sexual abuse. And I don't want to dwell on these negative examples too long. It does get depressing. And imagine all of you probably feel really down right now because you relate in some ways to this and how it can deplete your batteries or deplete your bank account or your love tank. This is very real. To return to the three pillars of leadership, do you know your love language? What makes you feel confident and capable? How do you relate to others? Are you an encourager, a hugger, a gift giver? Do you do things for others or like to be with others? Whatever you find the most easy to do for others is likely the love language that means the most to you and will be likely what feeds you as well. Be honest with your significant others in your life so they can love you well. And be a student of others in your life so that you can love them well. This relates back to the second pillar. Do you know others so you can build them up? Do you have a roommate who doesn't reciprocate your acts of service, but loves when you offer a word of encouragement? Do you have a sibling who is the best they can be when you brought home a small trinket for them? 
As a boss or employee someday, how will you relate to the others around you? Will a small touch to the arm inspire your employee to give their best work? Will arranging for an employee to work around their family schedule more invite greater loyalty and work ethic in your business? There's one more area I want to touch on. We're going to go on from yes. We're going to leave that one there. And by the way, this is the five language, love languages if you want to get it. This is Dr. Gary Chapman, one of the best books you'll ever read. Keep it in your library if you don't have it. Get it. Um, there's your deposits and withdrawals. There is one word I want to talk about, and it is the word but. This one word can negate a mountain of positives, close off communication, and set up barriers like no other. Now, how many of you have heard this? You did a great job on that test, but maybe next time you could get a 95 instead of a 90. That was a great breakfast, but the toast was a little burnt. You played a good game, but you missed that penalty kick. I know you worked hard on this project, but the chart was missing. We've all heard these lines and countless others. Do you ever remember the positive words that came before the word but? Never, right? We always remember the one, the negative ones that came after. So here's something to consider. What if we replace the word but with the word and? Now consider this. That was a great breakfast, and I especially loved the scrambled eggs. Would it be okay if we could spend time together next Saturday making breakfast together? You could do the eggs, and I'd love to offer to do the toast. Or, you played a great game tonight. I noticed you spent a lot of time practicing your shots, and I'm excited to see how you keep improving with continued practice. Or, I know you worked hard on this project. The client was expecting graphs in this report, and I trust you'll include those before we get the report out. Doesn't and set a softer, more collaborative tone? It is one small fix to incorporate into our communication that makes a huge difference in how we relate to others. And this is a great segue into conflict management. And there are literally hundreds of books written on this subject and probably thousands of opinions on it. For the sake of time and efficiency, I'm just going to focus on two different strategies. The first one comes from another one of my favorite books, Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. Anybody here read this or familiar with her? She's got lots of YouTube videos too. If you don't have time to read a book, just go watch a couple of her videos online. She's fantastic. Here's conversations. So this is what she says, and I will quote her from her book. If you need to confront someone's behavior, do not begin by asking that person how things are going or by complimenting him or her. Don't surround your message with pillows. Come straight at the issue, get right to the point. Say what you have to say in 60 seconds and immediately extend an invitation to your partner to join the conversation. Interesting. 60 seconds sounds a little intimidating to me. It appears impossible. But if you deliver with skill and grace, it can be extremely powerful and effective. There's seven points to include when you were doing this 60 second presentation and it's worth it. These seven are, name the issue, Select a specific example that illustrates the behavior or situation you want to change. And we're going to come back to these. I'm going to say real quick. Describe your emotions about the issue. Clarify what's at stake. Identify your contribution. Indicate your wish to resolve and invite your partner to respond. So to take a closer look at each one, we're going to name. Oh, uh, we're going here. We're going to name the issue. Back to that. Name the issue. The, the problem named is the problem solved. Be very specific. Are there lots of issues at the core? Come back, or lots of issues at stake? Come back to the core. Which one is the one that needs to be dealt with? Do the thinking, or you will end up frustrated and confused, both of you. Next, select your specific example. It has to be succinct. No big, long stories. Get to it. Describe your emotion. Emotions are deeply personal and intimate and disarming. You are affected if there's a problem and you are vulnerable. Clarify what is at stake. And the key word here is at stake. Use those words. It has emotional impact, but men, uh, remember to do it calmly and quietly. The more charged the language is, the gentler and quiet it needs to be delivered. Identify your contribution to the problem. 
How have I behaved in ways that guaranteed the outcome that I am unhappy with? It is essential we take the plank over our own eye first. And then indicate your wish to resolve the issue and make sure you use the word resolve. That means there's no termination or ending. More relationships are saved than ended when you use this word. And then invite your partner to respond and say, I want to understand your perspective. Can you tell me more about this? So now we're going to go to, again, this is from her book and I'm going to read out. I did this, if, if any of you know PowerPoint, you know, never put lots of words on the screen. We did this on purpose because I wanted to look a little intimidating. I'm going to read it really fast. And if you want to time me, you can. It will take about 60 seconds to read through this. Jackie, I want to talk with you about the effect your leadership style is having on the team. I learned that when John asked you questions, you told him you didn't have time for private tutoring sessions. And I learned that during a meeting with the team, you wanted up a page from the flip chart, threw it on the floor and said it wasn't the team you had signed up for when you left the room. I'm deeply concerned and I'm fearful of the possible consequences. There's a great deal at stake. A long-term employee has considered leaving the company rather than work with you. I'm not prepared to lose good people who I hope will be here long after this project is completed and you've gone on to your next assignment. Meeting or deadline is essential. Our reputation as a product leader is on the line, as well as our professional pride, pleasing our customers and maybe considerable financial gain. Perhaps there's little or at nothing stake for you, but if it doesn't work out, you can leave us and undoubtedly get another job quickly. But for us, the stakes are high. My role in creating a growing rift between you and the others is that I didn't bring this to your attention earlier. This is what I want to resolve with you, Jackie. The effect your leadership style is having on the team. I want to understand what's happening from your perspective. Please talk to me about what's going on with the team. Did anyone time that? 60? So minute and three. Um, she got everything in there, didn't she? Did you hear all the name the issues? We're going to go through them here. There's name the issue. Jackie, I want to talk about the effect your leadership style is having on the team. Does it fit? This is the, we're going to break down the whole paragraph here. So your specific example, she wadded up the paper and threw it on the floor. So they didn't get into it. Just put the details and the facts out. The next one, I'm deeply concerned. Put your emotions into it. Fearful, concerned. The next one, at stake. And this is where she, in this case, went into a, a much more uh, longer a narrative, and it doesn't always have to be this way. You can put in longer narrative somewhere else. It's, there's no um, must on this. But in this one, she went into it. Of what is at stake and use those words. What is your role? She waited too long to bring it up. I and apologize. My role in creating is I didn't wait. I didn't do it quick enough. Resolve. This is what I want to resolve and state it. Make sure it's very clear. This is what I want to resolve with you. So there's no ending, there's no termination. We're going to figure this out. Now, invite them in. Please talk to me about what's going on. Effective? Yeah? No? Mm -hmm. Let's take um, all of the issues have been presented clearly and professionally in 60 seconds. Now, Here's the tricky part. It can take about 45 minutes to put this together. Would it be worth it? Considering the conflict that could come out of it? 45 minutes to solve a 60 second problem in my mind is well worth 45 minutes. It might be less, it could be more. Present it well with gentleness and intention. Still, it's not a guarantee for success, is it? What if Jackie says uh, she's not gonna cooperate? <laughs> this can happen. They could respond poorly, negatively, or even aggressively. <clears throat> so in that case, again, there's dozens, probably hundreds of books and opinions written on this, but my favorite is Necessary Endings by Henry Cloud. Has anybody read Boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud? Again, one of the best books ever, isn't it? He's also uh, written this one, uh, Necessary Endings. And from here, he says, um, it is important Oh, sorry, I'm going to back up here. Uh, from necessary endings, um, sorry, let's determine the difference between hurt and harm. This is what he, he really brings out in this book. He states, we all hurt sometimes in facing hard truths, but it makes us grow. It can be the source of huge growth. That is not harmful. Harm is when you damage someone. Facing reality is usually not a damaging experience, even though it can hurt. Have you ever heard the difference between hurt and harm? 
We don't like hurt. Let's go a little farther. As a leader in business, it can be crucial to define what positive and negative is. Positive is to act in the best interest of business and the people. They're not exclusive. When faced with the conflict of an underperforming and failing employee, one can use that strategy of the 60 second presentation that we just looked at. If it doesn't work, you have to realize there's only three results coming out of this. And the first one is the employee was unaware of the problem. They recognize the problem once it's been presented. They accept responsibility. They change their behavior and performance to grow and mature within the company. And you have helped them face the truth about themselves and they have matured. Isn't that wonderful? That's positive. But hurt had to be caused to get that positive result, correct? Here's another uh, scenario that could happen. The employee might be miscast. They might possess great talent and skill, but they're in the wrong position or job for that talent and skill. You might help them get off of a road of failure and onto one of success. So again, a hurtful conversation ended up being very positive. Final scenario, the employee refuses to accept responsibility. They don't see the need to improve or change and they end up blaming you and your poor leadership. They now hate you and they see themselves as a victim of your poor leadership. If this is the case, you have now discovered someone who was in a key position that was probably not a learner and you have now protected your company, yourself and your employees from the effects going forward. So again, hurt now is positive within your company. All three of the above brought hurt to another person, but all ended up with positive results. So another way to think about hurt and harm is to think about the infected or abscessed tooth. It's painful and it requires a trip to the dentist, perhaps to have that tooth pulled or at least worked on. That causes more pain, more hurt. On the way home, still hurts. You might describe this event as negative because you're feeling lousy and you're experiencing some physical pain. If your definition of negative is harmful, then this was not a negative event. It was a positive one because it brought relief and healing in spite of the pain. Hurt does not equal harm. Remember that causing someone hurt can be positive. The last subject I want to talk about is humility. It's, I think, the most important because it has stood the test of time. It has relationship at its heart and it holds up to the three pillars of leadership. Does anybody have a definition of humility? What would you say? I found all kinds. You're probably thinking of it in your head. Miriam Webster online says humility is freedom from pride or arrogance. The Cambridge Online defines it as the quality of not being proud because you are aware of your bad qualities. <laughs> it's true. That's what it said. I didn't like that one. If you're familiar with Numbers 12.3 from the Bible, is anyone familiar with that verse? It says, now Moses was more humble than any person on earth. Who wrote Numbers, the book of Numbers? Oh. Why is that? I'm just here to mumble. Moses wrote it. Again, it seems, sounds like a self-defeating statement. You know, um, how can someone as truly humble declare that he's the most humble person on the planet? Well, he did. So what's the true definition of humility? Well, the NIV Bible defines humility as the show of submission or weakness. Or meekness, I'm sorry. And being humble as not to think too highly of oneself to bring low or prostrate. And my favorite is from C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century who said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I love that. It seems these definitions can be summed up as having an authentic view of oneself. Moses knew who he was, his strengths and his weaknesses, and that he was ultimately a servant of God. How important is this in leadership and business? Well, in 1996, Jim Collins conducted a survey of 1,435 companies from the Fortune 500 list to determine what took them from good to great in performance and sustainability. 
only 11 of those over 1400 companies rose to the top, according to the study's preset criteria, and it was extensive, too extensive to include in tonight's speech. The one trait shared by all 11 CEOs of those companies was humility, the top characteristic. They were the first, and I love this, to look through the window to give credit where credit was due. And they were the first to look in the mirror to assign responsibility, never blaming external factors. Conversely, the companies that were at the very bottom did exactly the opposite. The CEOs claimed credit for success and they cast blame when things did not go well. Now go back to the first pillar of leadership. Knowing yourself, do you give credit where credit is due? Do you take credit for others' ideas or hard work? Likewise, do you accept responsibility for your mistakes or shortcomings? Or do you blame others for them? One of the most humble human beings that I know is a man who has positively influenced and impacted thousands of lives, and his name is Jim Rilling. He was a church planter, a lead pastor, an associate pastor, active in many churches over his career. Jim would get up each morning, pray, do his devotions, and ask himself, what can I do today to make my boss look good? <laughs> he served others, building them up with encouragement and strength. His humility, hard work, and dedication were critically instrumental in building up the last church he was a part of in numbers, depth, and maturity. His commitment to serve others and constantly humble himself brought unity to the staff and peace and confidence to the congregation. He was and still is a pillar in his community, even as a retired pastor today. So at the heart of everything we do is relationships. About five and a half years ago, I was privileged to be elected to the inaugural board of directors for the brand new UCP party in Alberta. Very shortly after this election, I was at a meeting in Drayton Valley. I met there the father of Mark Smith, the MLA at the time for Drayton Valley, Devon. Mr. Smith had been involved in politics almost his whole life. I think he was, he was in his late 80s at the time. He had met many premiers and had been involved in many campaigns and political events. He was well known, highly respected. And when we were introduced, he immediately grabbed me, expressed that he would like to speak with me. Let's go. When we went to, he was a choleric, by the way, a, a power, power one. And it was a lovely sunny day. He took me outside and for the next 20 minutes, I listened and he spoke and he mentored me and shared with me his thoughts. I can't tell you really verbatim anything he said that day, five and a half years ago, except this. And he said, if there's nothing else you take away, Jennifer, it's this, relationships, relationships, relationships. It's all about relationships. And I still remember it today. And I have grown up in a family and community that has valued people and relationships. It was all authentically lived out in front of me my entire life. If there's one thing you will take away this evening, I would say that it was what Mr. Smith shared with me. Relationships, relationships, relationships. It's all about relationships. Every person we come across is a valuable human being, a brother, sister, mother, father, aunt, uncle, a son, a daughter, a neighbor, a grandparent or a friend. Each of us is unique with talents, skills, abilities, and the profound need to relate to others and to be valued. When we develop the skills we need to relate to others well, we build bridge, bridges and we strengthen those around us. And that is what I would leave you with tonight. If there's one thing you take away, it is relationships. And I want to thank you for this opportunity again. And thank you to Berman for having me in. And if you have any questions, I'd love to take them out. We're at 10 to 8. So we've got about two minutes for questions. Do you remember what an MLA is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, still yes.